Have you ever wondered where you really stand with God? Are you overcome with feelings of guilt because of things you've done wrong? Are you tired of religion that focuses on rules that you can't keep? Have we got good news for you? It's time to listen in on some casual conversation with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski and discover what true freedom is all about. This is Growing in Grace. Hey everybody, I'm Joel Brzezinski, Mike Kapler. This week, we're going to be celebrating, this will be 12 years that we've been doing the Growing in Grace podcast. We've had people that just in the last few weeks, maybe even the last few days, have found the podcast. We received a really nice letter, uh, a little nice uh, email recently from somebody. They, she said it was an answer to prayer, you know, finding the podcast. This woman had been bound in legalism for many years, and uh, she had been praying and she needed basically, in my own words, deliverance from this this legalism that she was bound up in. And uh, she found the grace and the love of God. It's something that is meant to set people free. God's gospel is good news, and it's meant to set people free. When you know the truth of the gospel, you will be set free. And so that's why we've been doing this for 12 years. And that's why uh, we will continue to do it as long as we're able to. No... Uh, signs of uh, wanting to end here, but we'll always uh, just take it day by day. We've never even discussed stopping the podcast before. Right. Maybe that day will come at some point, but I don't think it's ever been in our conversations uh, up to this point. You know, once you begin to taste of this freedom, this spiritual freedom, you just can't get enough of it. You just, I mean, you, you just become so passionate about it. And I guess that's why we, we do this week in and week out. So, but well, we've been talking about confession and the often misunderstood verse of First John 1, 9, where religion has taught us that we need to confess all our sins in order to stay in fellowship and stay forgiven. So you might back up several programs at least to get caught up on where we're at today, because obviously we on these short podcasts, we can't keep going over everything. However, we do want to make a, a few connections that we were talking about toward the end of last week's program, starting with when John was talking about this confession thing in, in 1 John 1, uh, right around verses 8, 9, and 10, understanding the context leading up to it, that he re really wasn't addressing believers in that first chapter of his book. We tied in Romans chapter 10, something Paul wrote about uh, the confession of the Lord Jesus Christ and believing with the heart. And Joel, um, you kind of brought up something uh, right before we came on today that we might want to point out to, that uh, I thought was interesting. Yeah, I think it's really, uh, I had shared something on Facebook uh, about Romans 10, just pointing out that the righteousness that we have in Christ Jesus is not our works. We can certainly do righteous things, but those righteous things are not our righteousness, because our righteousness is God's righteousness that he gives us as a gift. Romans 10.10 10 says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. One believes not works unto righteousness. So it's not our works through which we're righteous, but it's when we believe. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, tying this into what we're talking about is that it's when we believe that we're made righteous. That confession of Christ that we make is basically, it's a sign that we believe. We're confessing that Jesus is Lord. We're saying, hey, we believe. But it's not this over and over and over confession of our sins that makes us righteous or that washes us or that cleanses us. As we've talked about, First John 1, 9 was talking about unbelievers acknowledging that there is such a thing as sin. And then when they acknowledge this thing called sin, which believers have already done, then they receive this forgiveness that was provided in Christ Jesus. But my point that I wanted to make on that again is that the righteousness that we have, we've been made righteous, we've been justified, we've been saved by the blood of Jesus, and it's God's righteousness that he's given us as a gift. It's not something that we keep receiving over and over again with an over and over confession of sins. Yeah, this is the kind of confession John was talking about, the confession of Christ for unbelievers to receive the gift of salvation. Unlike those uh, Gnostic unbelievers, you know, in order for us to believe God raised Jesus from the dead, it would just make sense to assume that one would also have to believe Jesus came in, in the, the flesh, flesh in human form. 
So as believers, again, our, our ongoing confession isn't meant to be focused on our sinful failures that God doesn't remember anymore. It's now rooted in who Jesus is and the belief in what he has done for us. So in tying that in, it's something that Joel mentioned last week. Let me start with this. Several times after John's first chapter in First John, after chapter one, he'll begin to change the language where it becomes evident he is specifically writing to believers, to Christians, and, and he uses language that he doesn't use in that first chapter. And including First John chapter four, verse two, he comes back to what he was talking about in the first chapter because this was a big deal, acknowledging that Jesus Christ really came in the flesh. And he says this, First John four, two, three chapters later, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Again, he's trying to steer them away from this thing that had been circulating around in their community about whether Jesus really came as a man. And, and something Joel pointed out last week in that same chapter of First John, John coming back to it again, whoever confesses, and, and tie this into Romans chapter 10, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we've already got this fellowship going on here that um, is in place for us. And so we, we just see some some places there. Even in, in John's fifth chapter, he points out that he is writing to those who believe. But he, again, he, he didn't do that in the first chapter. So Joel, really, this whole thing about 1 John 1, 9, it's been so misunderstood and, and really put a lot of people in bondage because we just need to use a little common sense here. I mean, if the math simply would not add up, if we were required to confess all of our sins from this point forward, we'd be doomed because who could do that? Every wrong thought, every wrong action, whether you realize it or not, everything that you say, I mean, you know, the smallest, slightest little thing, forget about the big ones. Those are easier to remember sometimes, but there's all kinds of things that can take place in the course of any given day or week that sometimes we don't view it as sin. But, you know, if it falls short of perfection, that's really... That's really what it is. And if you were going to sit there and try to confess them all, uh, I wonder how that would work out for you. It's fuzzy math. It just doesn't add up. And to think that you can fall back on the blanket confession where, well, God, I can't remember everything I've done, but forgive me anyway. That's not really confessing them all. (laughs) No, it's not. And if you put it in, in a picture form, you know, you know that God is with you, but just picture God out there in heaven. And you're down here on earth. It's not really this way because God is always with you. But this is kind of the mentality that I go about my life and then I sin. And then I think, based on the misinterpretation of 1 John 1, 9, that God is waiting there in heaven until I admit to him that I did that or until I confess that I did that. He's withholding forgiveness He's withholding his presence. He's withholding cleansing. He's withholding righteousness until I confess that. Well, what if I die without having confessed that? Or what if, for whatever reason, a day goes by? Am I then not clean? Am I not righteous? Not in fellowship with him? Is he waiting for me to confess a sin or sins? And then I'll be cleansed again. If you think about that, that means that you go through periods of your life where you're not righteous, you're not clean, you're not right with God. The problem with that mentality is that it takes away from what the blood of Jesus has really accomplished. It's far greater than what we really think. We've spent a lot of time in the book of Hebrews that talks about how the sacrifice of Jesus was the propitiation for sin, for all sin. All of our sin was taken away. It was taken away. God is not waiting for us to confess to him what he has taken away and what he has chosen to remember no more. And so, you know, I can understand, again, this this idea of it being like kind of a safety net, but it's even better than that. It's so much better than that. The fact that Jesus Christ, through his blood, has taken our sin away. <laughs> you know, God's not waiting for us to confess our sin. What he really wants is for us to know that we are one spirit with him, 1 Corinthians six seventeen, We are one spirit with him because 
of what the blood of Jesus has done. So when we do something that we don't like or we realize that was sinful or that wasn't righteous, that was ungodly, we can actually, instead of going through a period of mourning and feeling low and feeling like, oh, I got to wait till I'm in the right mind to confess this to God or whatever. I don't know what you go through, but you can just get up and say, God, I am so thankful for what the blood of Jesus has accomplished for me. Thank you that you are with me right here and right now. Because of the blood of Jesus, I'm cleansed, I'm forgiven, I'm righteous, I'm holy, I'm justified, and you can move on. You can get up and and move on. You know, you're not denying what happened. You're just acknowledging that the grace of God and the blood of Jesus is bigger than what happened. And that's something we can rest assured in. Yeah, here's here's another chapter 1, verse 9, that would be beneficial for us to remember, and that's from 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Uh, God is faithful. See, we, we sometimes get the, the whole focus and the spotlight on us and our faithfulness. This is about him. Right? Mm-hmm. This isn't about you and me. This is about him. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see, he called us into fellowship. This isn't something that is contingent upon your faithfulness. It's based upon his faithfulness to us, even when we're not faithful. It's good to be faithful, right? But even when we're not, God is still faithful toward us. If you look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.13, he called us into fellowship. He's not going to go back on that call, and he's not going to recall the call. Uh, He's not going to change his mind or turn his back on you or avoid you or ignore you or any of that other yuck, 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 yuck. You know, if you're looking for that kind of treatment, you can go to church and uh, interact with your fellow (laughs) inmates if you want to really, you know, be ignored and, you know, have fellowship problems and all of that. But uh, I'm joking a little bit there. But uh, so, so our fellowship with God is always ongoing for us now, because sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you're still forgiven, but you need to confess in order to stay in good fellowship with God. We just need to even get away from that because there's just no boasting in this new covenant. God isn't going anywhere. We were invited into his household and confession just, it's not a requirement when it comes, because God threw our sins away, remembers them no more. There's no reason to sit around begging for forgiveness anymore. And I like what you were saying, Joel, when it comes to our identity, just a few other things here, and you might have said a few of these, but you're anointed, you're alive. In Christ, you're blameless, you're complete, you're forgiven, you're holy. Uh, You now have peace, you're perfected, you're reconciled, you're righteous, you're sanctified. These should be our confession going forward, not the failings that sometimes will take place as as we... uh, grow in in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, one of the things you said there, righteous, among many things. Now, how many people, if you would go into a vast majority of of Christian churches today, how many people, if you ask for a show of hands, how many people here are righteous and holy? How many hands would go up? Sadly, I've seen this happen, and, and not many hands go up, because they really haven't been taught their identity in Christ. They're trying to establish still righteousness by what they do we'll talk about that how to be righteous next week on growing in grace this has been growing in grace with mike kapler and joel brzezinski heard online through various internet sources around the world each week to access hundreds of past programs visit graceroots.org share it with a friend and listen again next week for more growing in grace